concerned. So today we're going to talk about turning it over to him, and we're starting a series in 1 Samuel. So every week we're going to talk a little bit about one of the chapters. I don't have time to go through every single verse. Sunday morning isn't really a Bible study, unless you come at 855 next door, then that's a Bible study, but this isn't. And uh, so, but uh, although we study scripture together, we have to move along a little more quickly on Sunday morning. And so, um, but I'm glad you're here. So we're going to be doing this series on 1 Samuel, and we're going to talk about the heart of God. And let me tell you what I'm going to say in this series over and over. The good news is that God knows your heart. And the bad news is that God knows your heart. And so, you know, every day you have choices. My mom, when we were young and my sisters were over this week and we got to talk about how they used to clean the house. And my mom would say to my sister, Kelly, I wish you could clean like your sister, Tracy. Well, what my mom did not know is that my sister, Tracy, would take the vacuum cleaner, put it in her room, turn it on, and then turn on the TV, do her nails or whatever, and just let the vacuum run so that my mom thought she was diligently cleaning when she was actually taking a break. And my sister verified this lie that she did. And, um, My sister Kelly was always like, yeah, I can clean like that. And uh, so anyway, it's really funny. But then, uh, uh, so they were over the other day. There's still some bitterness there. Um, But the truth is, no one knows exactly what you're thinking. No one knows your heart like God does. And um, for many of us, that's good news. And there are times that, if we're honest, that's bad news. Because we might come to the pastor after church and be like, Pastor, that was a great sermon. And then on the way home, be like, oh my gosh, it was awful. And so, um, what? So here's the, the summation today. If you want to live a victorious Christian life, it is a life of faith. You can change from fear to faith in a moment with God's help. And that is what so many of us need to do when we're struggling with fear, when we're struggling with doubt, when we're struggling with a decision. Sometimes we just need God. God, would you touch me, help me to have faith in this moment? And so today we're going to talk about trust, surrender, and speaking the right things as the keys. And here's the truth I want you to know today. God does not always give us what we ask, but he always changes us. And so know that if you're praying for something, if you're asking God for something right now, he may not give you what you're asking for, but he may change you in the meantime. And he always does that. So let's start off and we're going to pick up here. Number one, trust his word before things change. Trust his word before things change. So let me introduce you. First Samuel, what happens is Hannah's husband is married to two guys and Um, Obviously, in Genesis, uh, God's design was for one, but because of the hardness of people's hearts, um, this guy married two women, and one of them was able to have children, but Hannah wasn't. So so his other wife basically was picking on Hannah every day, and nah, 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 nah. So it was a lot of fun to be a sister wife in that house. And, uh, And so Hannah was upset, and she went to her husband and said, basically, I don't have any kids, and, you know, God's punishing me, and all this kind of stuff. And he looks at her, and he goes, aren't I enough for you? Which is a typical man response. It shows that men have always been the same over the years, totally insensitive and totally clueless to what matters. And so, but he was a good guy. And, uh, and yet he thought, well, I should be enough for you, which was not the answer she wanted to hear. By the way, sometimes when women ask you a question, the best uh, uh, answer is, uh, what do you think? So that's what you should do. So She goes to the temple, she's crying profusely, she's mumbling and talking to God out loud, and so the priest that's there thinks she's drunk. And he basically goes to her and says, get out of here, you drunk woman, and then we pick up the story. 1 Samuel 1, 15 through 18. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I love that she feels like she has to explain what drink she's not having. And she says, I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked him. Now, time out. I want you to pay attention here. Eli does not say you're going to get what you asked for. 
He just says, I hope God gives you what you're asking for. That's all he said. He didn't promise anything. He didn't say your prayer is answered. He didn't say exactly what your prayer is going to He said, I hope, I hope too that God gives you what you've asked for. And listen to what happens next. There's a change of faith right here. Here we go. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then... She went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. I love this. She got a Snickers. (laughs) Right? And what happened? She goes and she says, you know, I'm going to eat. Which, by the way, some of you, some of you, truthfully, you're just hangry. So it's good. But the truth is, what happened? Her face was no longer downcast. Why? Because even though nothing had changed... Her faith changed. And I want to tell you something. When you're praying for God to answer a prayer request, maybe it's for a person, maybe it's for a situation, maybe it's something the doctor said, I got to see you tomorrow. By the way, I always say when doctors are in a hurry, I don't like that. When they're like, see you in six weeks, it's like, yeah. When they're like, come in tomorrow, oh no. If they say, come in right now, pack your bag just in case, right? Right? And so what happens? Suddenly, she's looking for an answer from God. And she says, I'm just going to trust him. And it changes everything. Her attitude changes. We've all seen that look when people are struggling. And some of us know people who have been angry and frustrated for so long that their face shows it. And let's say a Botox, right? We, we see those things and what happens? Our faces change. So let me ask you this question. Are you trusting God with whatever's next for you? Whether you've gotten good news or not. Even if it's the answer you don't want, are you going to trust him? One of my favorite prayers that I saw years ago on a plaque, it said, Lord, I don't understand you, but I trust you. By the way, if you can understand God, he's not God. Hebrews 11.1 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. So let me give you something practical to do. What verse? What verse are you believing God for? I want to encourage you, if you're struggling in an area, whether it's health Maybe it's fear, maybe it's frustration, maybe it's the future. I want to encourage you, look for a verse on that. The the Bible app, even Google, you can look up verses on fear. I don't know why you would type this many times, but you could. Verses on fear, right? Enter. And then take one of those verses, write it out. Now, writing something, we used to use this thing called a pen or a pencil, and we used something called paper. It's kind of like parchment, similar to a scroll. (laughs) Or you can put it in your phone and have a verse that you begin to say, God, I'm trusting you for this. And ask God to put a specific verse on your heart. Why? To begin to change the object of your faith. Your faith is not in you, number one. By the way, have you ever been disappointed with yourself? There was a day this week that literally I went home and said, I'm so disappointed with me. Have you done that lately? If you haven't, I can teach you, give you lessons. Right? So you don't depend on you. And, you ready for this? Don't depend on your circumstances. Students, I want you to know something. As you graduate, ladies, here's the truth. Life changes like that. And it's not always things we like. And sometimes we just walk through them and say, God, I trust you. I don't know what's next. Or any of you where you thought you'd be when you graduated from high school? I was going to be a drummer in a band. Miss that one. Well, except for last night, right? I got to play last night. Number two, surrender your best to God. I heard a great story this week. Have you ever heard of a company? It's a little company. It's called, um, let me see, uh, Uber. Anybody heard of Uber? Right? Everybody's heard of Uber, right? 
And so the head of Uber, the CEO, you ready? Billionaire. Not a millionaire, billionaire. Like he uses millionaire money just for like extra money. He's got billionaire money. He decided that he was going to drive this last summer. So he drove a hundred people to their destinations. He said he was amazed at people. First of all, he was amazed at the conversations that they would have, like he wasn't even there. He was amazed at the people who were generous. He said there was a couple of times. Now, what he did is after he'd give them a ride, they would refund the money because he didn't need it. He got a secondhand Tesla to drive people around in. I mean, for him, that's a junky car. I thought that was funny too. He's like, I just got a secondhand Tesla, like it was some kind of downgrade. But here's what blew him away. He would give people rides, and he said sometimes the people that were obviously the poorest people would pull cash out of their pockets. And he said, and I felt so bad because I can't refund cash. He said, but they were insistent that I would take a tip. And he said it was unbelievable how grateful people were. I really feel like so often we think we're doing such a great thing for God when we don't really even recognize that he doesn't need anything we do. But guess what? He's grateful for what we do. Listen to what happens next here. So Hannah gets pregnant. She has a son. She weans him, which was three to five years at this time, to which my mom said to me last night, I don't think I could have given you up. And I got to thinking, I remember me at five. She might have been more willing than she admits at this point. <laughs> <laughs> she raises him as a Nazarite. She names him Sammy, right? When the bull had been sacrificed, verse 25, they brought the boy to Eli, who was the priest, and she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I'm the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. And I can put in parentheses, and you accused me of being drunk. She didn't say that. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me when I ask him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. Now, we don't know if that means Samuel or if that means Eli, but either way, God was worshiped. Why? Because she came and said, God, you gave me this, and it's yours. If you think that's something rare, I want to read you what it says in the New Testament about us. Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So basically, when you begin understanding how good God's mercy is, here's what you should do. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. By the way, you know what the problem with a living sacrifice is, right? It crawls off the altar. And so you say, God, I surrender to you today, and then your day starts. And that person is in your path, in the left lane. <laughs> that person's behind you, and you're in the right lane, and they're tailgating you. And you begin asking Jesus to take care of them, right? <laughs> so what happens? We surrender to the Lord, and then guess what? We have to continually re-surrender. God, I surrender to you again. Surrender your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You really want to worship God? Surrender who you are. Surrender what he's given to you. Say, God, I, I'm yours, so use me today the way you want. And then it continues. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How? By renewing your mind. Why? The enemy always attacks in your mind first. He wants you to think that you're worthless, that you don't matter, that nobody needs you. Why? Because you won't help anybody like that. Or he'll do the other extreme. You're the best thing to ever happen to people. And then nobody will want to be around you either, right? So either way, the enemy will plant in your mind either that you're too good for other people or you're nothing. And so what do you do? You surrender it to God. Why? So that I can be a blessing. And then it continues. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let me ask you, have you surrendered your best 
to God. There's an old uh, story, I'm pretty sure it's an urban legend, but I like the story. Uh, and, and I do know that Queen Elizabeth was notorious for sneaking out of the castle even when she was young. There was actually a recent movie made about her and her sister after World War II sneaking out and to go dance with the soldiers. Did you know that? Scandalous, I tell you. And so one night, uh, uh, there was a man uh, who was home in England, and of course, England has a lot of rain, and all of a sudden, a knock came out the door, at the door, and there was a, 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 a young lady at the door, and she said, can I have an umbrella? So it's England. So he had a ton of umbrellas. He looks over. He finds the rattiest, junkiest umbrella he could find, and he hands it to the young lady and closes the door. The next day, a whole entourage came up. A man gets out of what he recognized as the queen's entourage. He opens the door, and the man says, with this ratty umbrella in hand, the queen wants to thank you for your generosity. <laughs> and of course, he thought, if I had known it was the queen, I would have given her my best. And here's the truth about life. God knows your heart. And so when you surrender your life to him with the different people in your life, Jesus says that the way that you treat those who are hurting, the way that you treat the poor, the way that you treat those in prison, the way that you take care of those who are hurting is how you treat him. So just remember that next time. I'm not, but be careful about enabling people. I understand there's boundaries. I want you to have good boundaries, but I want you to bless people with your best umbrella. Give God your best, not just your leftovers. Now let me add one other thing to that. I want to encourage you to spend some time in God's word every day, but to do that at what's a good time for you. People argue all the time whether that should be in the morning, the midday, the afternoon, and here's what I say. When are you at your best? When can you pay attention? For me, that's the morning. The squirrels haven't woken up yet. Right, And so when I read my Bible in the morning, I can focus more. You let it get to the afternoon, the squirrels are running wild. I have no idea what I just read. I literally read the same verse 42 times and walk away and go, what did I just read? Right? And so whatever time is good, that is what you give to the Lord. Lord, I'm going to give you my best, not my leftovers. So let me ask you this question. Is there anything that you need to surrender to the Lord? Is there unforgiveness? Is there a sin in your life? Is there an area of your life where you're just saying to God, God, I'm going to give you a little bit, but I don't really want to surrender to you. Number three, speak blessings and thanksgiving. Now, one of the things my kids know is that I'm very hard to buy gifts for. But what they may not know is how much them saying thank you means to me. Just the times where they say, Dad, thanks for giving me a ride today. Thanks for picking me up in the middle of the night. Thanks for doing that. It, that means more to me than whether they got, although I got some cool socks from Ireland this year. They got sheep on them. I couldn't find my Mr. Rogers socks today, but. I want to encourage you to speak blessings and thanksgiving. What words come out of your mouth? And you can help other people with this. I went to visit a lady this week in a nursing home. And when I went to visit her, obviously, listen, you sit in a bed. I, I've been in the hospital a lot as a patient. When you sit in a bed hour after hour, you have way too much time to think. And the enemy loves to get you thinking the wrong way. Paul dealt with that in jail, right? That's why he wrote prison epistles. He wrote words to us to remind us, be careful what you think about. And so I was talking to this woman and I started asking her about life. And of course, she was very discouraged. And she told me about her husband passing away last year. And I asked her this question. How did you meet your husband? I wish you could have been there with me. Her face went from downcast and upset. Her face lit up. I could see the light come back in her eyes. And she told me how she met her husband. How he tricked her into going out. And then how they were getting ready to get married and she canceled the wedding last minute. And then they eloped to Las Vegas and got married in the Chapel of the Bells. And I went, woo, you wild woman, right? As she changed how she was thinking 
and began remembering all the blessings and all the good things, everything changed. You and I are the same way. You and I are the same way with how we think about life. Everything is not good. Did you know that? The Bible says he'll work it out for the good, but it doesn't say everything's good. The older you get, the more the check engine light comes on. And you can't like your car, you can't just put a sticker over it. And they can't reset the computer. Well, maybe they can do that. I don't know. So Hannah is thankful to God in chapter 2. It says, Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. Which is really funny when you think it's a sister wife that she's talking about being her enemy. Right? There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. She knew what God had done for her. Can I tell you something? Her life was not perfect. She just gave away her son. But yet she knew what God had done. And so she was grateful. I was thinking back to the book of Exodus did you know there's a place in the book of Exodus where the people began complaining? Began complaining about Moses, began complaining about their plight. And you know what God did? And this will show you the heart of God. God swallowed them. It says the land opened up and swallowed them. Wouldn't that be awesome? Do you have that person at work? They're a complainer and all of a sudden you go to work and you're like, yeah, I think you're complaining a little too. Oh. Now, thankfully, God doesn't do that anymore because all of us would get swallowed some days, right? If we're honest, we all have those days where we're like... Mur, 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 mur. But Hannah recognized what God has done. Listen, have you been thankful and grateful for what you have, for where you are, for what you've been through? Hey, your life, you ready for this, is not perfect. But you've got a lot of blessings. So what are you going to focus on? If Paul could be in prison and focus on the blessings of God, you can be back pain, arm pain, face pain, life pain, brain pain, right? And still rejoice. God, you're so good. Colossians 3 says it this way, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. By the way, if you haven't come to church discouraged and sang a couple songs and seen God lift you up, you're not doing it right. And then it says, and whatever you do, whether in word, what you say, or deed, what you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I want to ask you a final question. Do your words thank and bless and thank? Do your words bless and thank? I went to see Miss Dolores who had been, been coming to our service here on Sunday mornings. She's 93. Or as she told me this week, 93 and a half. And she would say something, and she'd say, I'm 93 and a half. I'm like, you know, the half doesn't really matter at 93, but okay. And she told me she got a bad report from her doctor, and she doesn't know if she's going to see Jesus soon. But can I tell you, while I was there for an hour, hour and a half talking to her, she talked about how good God's been to her. She talked about how blessed she is. She talked about how even though I couldn't have children, I've now adopted two children and my daughter's taking care of me here. And she was focused on how God, even in the middle of this trial, even in the middle of pain, even in the middle of the struggle, was blessing her and how he had already, always blessed her in the past. And she was just ready to go see Jesus if he was ready. And some of us today are complaining because we didn't get what we wanted. Our focus has got to begin to turn towards God. No matter what my circumstance, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to thank you. Life isn't easy. It's often very difficult. But even in the middle of that difficulty, you can have faith. Trusting that God is going to protect you and be with you, whether you're here today or in heaven this afternoon. And if he calls you home, you just walk that way. 
And in faith, you say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. Jesus came and died for our sins because we're all messed up and broken, every one of us. And I know this is a shocker. Even the pastor needs forgiveness. And so when you come to Christ and you say, I want forgiveness. I know you died on a cross and rose again to pay for my sins. And I surrender my life to you. Maybe today you want to do that. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to become a Christian. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but you've never been baptized. We're actually doing a baptism this afternoon. I'll baptize you with your clothes on. Just show up and say, I want to take that next step of faith with Christ. And you can do that today. We're going to close in prayer. We're going to have our time of giving. You give what God's put on your heart. But would you join me as we close in prayer today? Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Lord, thank you that in faith we can walk through any circumstance With faith, we can overcome, even on the days where we don't know what's next, that we can trust you. So, Lord, would you be with us as we give thanks? Would you give us strength through your spirit? Lord, I pray for that one today who's really struggling, that they would know your strength right now. In Jesus' name, amen.